welcome to the U3 Media Podcast, where our mission is to unite the world through coffee. I'm Christy Ross, and joining us today is Julia Stamberger, CEO and co-founder of the Planting Hope Company. Welcome, Julia. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Christy. I'm excited to be here, and I certainly believe in that mission, uniting world through coffee. Thank you. Thank you. So do we. So do we. Um, so thanks for being part of it. Uh, okay, so I'm going to give a quick background on you, and it it goes deep and wide. So you went to school for mathematics and science. You started as a DJ about 30 years ago and also managed a rock band. Not too many people can say that. Um, you've been a consultant for PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, founded numerous companies, and now for the past eight years, you're the CEO and co-founder of a plant-based food tech company um, that also happened to acquire Argo Tea Cafes in 2023. Oh my God, a lot of exciting stuff to talk about. Um, you've had an, an incredibly inter interesting career so far. So let's start with how you go from music to the world of plant-based foods. <laughs> Well, to start with, um, I think that anybody who has been in the music industry uh, may have felt at one point or another that if they stayed in the music industry, they might fall out of love with their core passion of music. <laughs> It's one of those industries where, you know, it's it's amazing creativity um, and yet at the same time, it's a business and sometimes combining creativity and business is hard. Um, other times combining creativity and business, such as what we're doing with the Planning Hope Company today, is very fun and very exciting because there's the ability to take and expand and scale and change the world on a whole different level that doesn't interfere with that creativity. It actually supports bringing that to fruition. And truly changing the world because Julia, you just share with us the mission behind the Planting Hope Company. So my founding partners and I, we've all been in the food industry a very long time. Um, anywhere from in my perspective, 20 years ago, I started the first airline snack box program that brought me into food. Another one of my founding partners was one of the folks that brought a lot of the brands that you see at Whole Foods uh, to there and grew them over a 45 year career. Another one of us was the head global purchasing manager at Whole Foods. We've all spent a lot of time in this industry. And what we saw was, number one, consumers love better for you food. Um, they understand the health benefits. They understand the taste benefits. You know, they are flocking to it like crazy. And that's enabled upstart growing brands to get traction in a world that previously was dominated by big CPG companies. That's the good news. Um, the bad news is, is that a lot of money flooded into this once it was proven that small companies could sell for giant multiples of revenue because they were able to accomplish the creativity and innovation, which was really challenging for the big guys. And sometimes where money goes, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily fulfill the promise and the vision. Um, saw that happen in the music industry. Sometimes making a buck interferes with the ability to get the best music out there. And in the food industry, sometimes making a buck dilutes the impact of the food products that are in the marketplace. So, you know, eight years ago, we took a solid look um, with the idea that, look, life's too short to be doing things that aren't having real meaning and impact. And let's face it, in a few years, we're going to be fe uh, feeding 10 billion people on this planet. Uh, climate change is real. And there are certain crops like almond, quinoa, avocados that are hyper nutritious and we rely on today that are not scalable. The climate is not going to support those long term. Um, people are looking for alternatives in big categories, plant-based dairy, rice and grains, healthy snacking. These are all categories that are growing like crazy. And why? Well, in plant-based dairy, it's been growing at a 15% uh, compound annual growth rate for the last 15 years because 75% of the planet is intolerant of dairy. Um, so alternatives like almond milk have been on the rise. Unfortunately, they don't supply the same nutrients and they're not scalable for the long term. So long story short, 
our mission at the Planting Hope Company is to take really scalable crops that we can grow and currently grow around the world with few resources like sesame, peas, beans, lentils, etc., and make them the core of great tasting food that are easy swaps for everyday food people eat all the time around the world. And with that type of food, we can feed 10 billion people in 2050. Absolutely. So, so Planting Hope, it's an award-winning food tech organization focused on developing these replacements, right, for the, for the common food items. Um, and it's not only nutritious, but also, you know, made from sustainable crops. So I want you to walk through some of the major products that you have developed. Absolutely. So um, our flagship product is our Hope and Sesame Sesame Milk. And we developed this to fill a key void that we saw in plant-based milk. So huge category, rapidly growing because most of the planet is intolerant of dairy milk and the lactose that's inside it. Well, sesame milk provides equivalent nutrition to dairy milk, eight grams of complete protein. That's eight times the protein that you get in almond milk and about three times what you can get from oat milk. But additionally, it uses 87% less water cradle to grave than almond. Sesame is an amazing crop. It grows with very uh, little water in hot, dry environments. It doesn't need pesticides or pollinators. It's a cover crop that renews the soil. So it's actually very functional and functional agriculturally. And if your question is, well, why haven't you know we made a sesame milk before? Why have I never seen one? Why is this the first, which right. we are? It's really hard to work with sesame. So you're talking about a crop that we've farmed successfully for more than 4,000 years, but we're using it primarily functionally or as an oil seed. So the way that you know, typically sesame is used is after it's farmed, it's pressed for oil. The oil is sold off as a commodity and there's a super nutrition dense pulp remaining. And typically we've been using it for animal feed or discarding it. We haven't been using it. Now in one liter of sesame milk, there's the equivalent of 20,000 sesame seeds. So if you can think of somebody, I mean- and That's crazy to me. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> but nobody's yeah. gonna sit there and chew up 20,000 sesame seeds. So with sesame milk, we have the ability to deploy that nutrition. You know, it's easily consumable, um, but it's in a different format than it's existed before. So an immensely nutritious, very agriculturally functional seed that we've now been able to deliver and deploy in a milk that froth, foams, steams, performs in hot and cold beverages. You can do great latte art out with it. It's got the body to be able to hold foam for a long period of time. We actually have a second upcycled ingredient in the sesame milk in our barista product that helps it to perform in coffee, uh, which is called aquafaba. And aquafaba is a fancy name for chickpea water. It's a byproduct of making hummus, but it makes a beautiful foam on the coffee. And I was able to actually test this here and 100%, I did not expect it to foam and, and steam and um, function like regular milk, but it did. And that was probably one of my biggest questions is what do you, you know, what do you put in there? Um, and here you go. It, it's, it's a chickpea based byproduct um, that you're using. If you boil chickpeas, you can even do this at home. You can make your own aquafaba if you want. It's only recently been commercialized in the last couple of years, but basically you boil chickpeas for hummus or for canning or for a recipe and that remaining water is the ingredient that we use in our barista milk. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was that sesame milk uses less water than creating almond milk. So mm -hmm. I've, I've created, I've um, made almond milk from mm -hmm. scratch and it does, it uses, it uses an immense amount of water. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, my understanding is it also, do, do, uh, creating sesame milk also uses less water than oat milk mm -hmm. and and dairy as well. Do you have those percentages like just so we can sort of compare across the board? Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to explain why too. So cradle to grave, the sesame milk uses 76% less water than oat milk, 87% less than almond, and 92% less than dairy. 
And that's based on a study that we did in conjunction with Planet Forward, which is an independent organization that, that has a huge database of these things and can go through and make the comparisons throughout the life cycle. But there are a couple of areas that are different. Number one is growing the actual uh, you know, core product itself. And for us, the core product is sesame, again, needs very, very little water, whereas I know we've all heard about the amount of water it takes to farm almonds, and oats require a significant amount of water as well. Nowhere near as much as almonds, but there's a bunch. Where oat consumes a lot of water is in processing the oats to create the oat milk. So the same process that you use to apply to corn that turns the natural sugars in corn into high fructose corn syrup is applied to oats. It's an enzymatic process and it converts those sugars into maltose. That's why if you look at the back of a box of oat milk, you won't see sugar necessarily on the ingredient label, but you will see added sugar on the nutrition facts panel is because of that sugar that's created in processing. By the way, um, the glycemic index of maltose is about 2x what you find in a can of Coke. So it's, it's a very, very spiky sugar that your body has a hard time processing. It's not great for diabetics. Oh, interesting. So how long did it take you to develop your sesame milk? Like how many, how many years? It meant many years. Well, so we, we didn't even know where to start, you know, at the beginning. Now, sesame milk, we didn't create the concept of sesame milk. People have been making it at home for years, just as you've made almond milk. But it's not a commercializable product made that way. Um, it, you know, you put it in the fridge, you know, two days later, it's rancid because of the oil content. So we had to figure out where to start. And again, we figured out that the way place to start was first you remove the oil and you work with that byproduct that's remaining that nutritious pulp. But it took more than five years of hard R&D and more than $10 million of investment that we, you know, as a startup company, right, we, we, <laughs> it took us that long to create it and to go through all the steps of, you know, first of all, we had this immense number of goals. We wanted it to be rich and creamy. We wanted it to have equivalent nutrition to dairy with eight grams of complete protein and all nine amino acids. Um, we even managed to develop an organic version as well. Now, we focused on a non-GMO version, but we covered a full spectrum of goals, and it required trial and error. Um, we involved top level beverage development scientists and flavorists. We developed um, organic compliant bitter blocking ingredients. Uh, sesame is naturally bitter. There's a bitter acid mm. in the hull of the seed. If you've had tahini, you've tasted that bitterness because it's ground sesame seeds, mm. that hull is removed on, on uh, hamburger buns. Uh, but, you know, that bitter, um, that bitter flavor is what makes it pest resistant. And so it's very positive agriculturally. It's not folks' expectation of how sesame tastes. For our unsweetened product, we had to develop organic compliant bitter blocking ingredients that float that bitter note over the tongue. So we spent about five years getting the core right and then another two perfecting it for barista purposes. It was a lot of work. How many other companies are making sesame milk now? Like, are there other sesame milks on the market? So we've seen one in Thailand that's effectively diluted tahini, um, and that's it. Um, you know, anything that we've really? seen that is in that universe is just sesame flavored. So it may be a soy milk with a sesame flavoring on top. Um, you know, sesame is very popular and, and growing it on trend as an ingredient and flavor. Mm -hmm. This year, Tarani's big syrup of the year they unveiled was toasted black sesame. Um, but there aren't any other commercialized sesame milks to our knowledge that have cracked the code on sesame as really the next new subcategory to enter the plant-based milk space mm -hmm. since oat milk. Well, so, and then you looked at oat milk and I read that, I think they really sort of came out or developed in 2016. And I read that they went from a $45 million industry to a $6 billion industry in seven years. So mm -hmm. if sesame milk, is the next oat milk um that's really exciting for the for the plenty based company that 45 million number comes from when oatly who had 20 years of experience in developing and producing and processing enzymatically based oat milk in sweden came to the u.s and then that scaling all happened really in an even more concentrated period of time um, because the oat milk, you know, Oatly had problems producing that product in the U.S. and scaling it because it's so sticky. 
folks didn't want to run it on shared equipment. Mm. So for about three years, they were the only people in town and they had supply chain constraints. And then other folks figured it out and came into the market. Well, sesame milk's a lot more complicated to make than oat milk. So today we're the only ones and we think we've got a good period of time where we will still be the only ones before others figure out how to do it the way that we're doing it. But we'll see what happens. Right. Well, and you talked about sort of the, the first few steps that you took in creating this this new product. Do you use a um, food scientist, a chemist, as, like a chemist? Like what did you do as truly some of those first steps? Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, beverage science is a, is a very skilled science. Um, for instance, a flavorist, you know, is a six-year journeyman apprentice degree. It's not, you know, something you get, you know, in a, in a four-year college and that's it and you walk out the door. These are highly, highly specialized areas to do it at this level. And that's why, you know, in the plant-based beverage industry, you see a lot of Me Too's. Every nut milk is basically the same thing um, and produced the same way. Creating kind of a breakthrough new way of doing it, it requires a lot of technological know-how. Uh, so we partnered with a group of beverage scientists who came from top organizations and are extraordinarily skilled in this and worked together with them to achieve what we wanted to from a commercialized market standpoint. Yeah. Well, and talking about a commercialized market standpoint, like when, what was the hardest thing about actually commercializing this, getting the product off the ground, I mean, and truly marketing it? Well, there, there are two things I'd say, you know, there are things that work well in a lab and then you go out and you run them in an enormous batch on real equipment um, and produce a lot of it. And do you get the same results? And how do you do it consistently time after time after time? It's Plant-based proteins are really finicky. Uh, they don't necessarily act and react like dairy. So it's something where it's not just creating the product, but it's getting it to work at scale every production cycle and produce a consistent product. So that's kind of the next piece. And then after that, once you do have something that's performing the way that you want and you've locked all of that in, the next step is getting it off the ground and starting to show it. So we started by going to uh, coffee shows, you know, the Coffee Fest, Specialty Coffee Association to get in front of um, baristas to get in front of coffee shop owners also though to get in front of distributors and the really hard part is the distributors because the distributors are focused on moving cases and this is something which is kind of critically important to understand um, you know they don't want the 30th oat milk they want one oat milk and one backup oat milk because when you go into a cafe and you order an oat milk latte, you're not then given a choice of brands. You're given whatever the supply is. Right. So for us, it was critically important to get into the distributors first, you know, before other sesame milks came around to be the first mover there and to protect those relationships. But it is not easy. I mean, you know, there's one region that we just opened up where we had 50 cafes that wanted sesame milk for a year before we could get that distributor to move on bringing in the product. And if we can't get it into distribution, then we can't get it to those cafes. So on the marketing size, phase one is that chicken and egg of building up enough demand with the cafes that the distributor will pay attention and bring in your product. And then we found that the next step is creating a great LTO, a great limited time offer a specialty beverage mm -hmm. that leverages sesame milk, which is not what we expected. At first, we're like, okay, you know, people have almond milk and soy milk and oat milk. Now add sesame milk. It's not how it works. You want to get a great LTO. And then if you have a great LTO, that's a, how you introduce the product to new consumers. And what we found was once we had a great LTO, then consumers would be like, oh, I really like sesame milk in that drink. Let me order it in my standard latte tomorrow. And that's how the adoption mm -hmm. happened. So, okay, so you won a Chicago Innovation Award. Um, first of all, I have to say congratulations. Um, I think that's exciting and definitely worth uh, definitely worth noting. Um, what did this winning What did winning this award mean to you, Julia? 
Well, you know, first it was, you know, a great, a great amount of validation around obviously the product and the idea. There's only one given out to a food company a year and, you know, the previous cohort are folks like, you know, McDonald's. <laughs> so, you know, we're in pretty good company. Uh, but also we've always been a very Chicago focused company. In fact, if you look carefully at our packaging, there are a couple of Easter eggs in the design that pay homage to that. And, you know, for the last, you know, since I moved to Chicago in, you know, I think it was about 99, um, you know, I focused on building businesses here. And we focused on supporting the entrepreneurial economy and bringing jobs into downtown Chicago that didn't exist here before. And there's been a long journey in terms of really building that support around entrepreneurship in Chicago in different categories. Um, it's always been better developed on the East and West Coast, but yet this is where we grow the food. Um, you know, a lot of the staple food is in the middle of the country. This is where we have a lot of the centralized food processing. This is the great place to do distribution because you can hit the coast. You know, food entrepreneurship needs to be in Chicago. And so supporting emerging brands, you know, not just the McDonald's of the world and saying this is a product that we believe has global opportunity, um, you know, and representing Chicago around the world. Uh, that was great validation for us. Yeah. Well, and I'm a big fan of Chicago. Anybody that knows me knows that. And I've been here for 30 years and I can't believe you and I did not cross paths right? in some way, shape or form. Um, but you have started so many different companies as a founder or a co-founder over the course of your career. So um, how many did you actually like start, run, sell? You, you got to have like, I'm imagining like this whole stat sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, um, you know, it, it exists if I sat down and think about it. Um, but you know, you know how it goes sometimes, you know, you create a number of them and then you roll them up and then you move them to something else or, you know, it's an evolving organism. But I think in, in terms of independent ventures, um, you know, everything from, you know, 501c6 not for profits to, you know, Delaware based LLCs and C corps focus primarily on, uh, technology, food service, and food, um, as well as some special purpose companies. You know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a way of life. I think if there's a milestone I'd look at, it's that, you know, I first, um, you know, I, the last time I worked for a company as a paid employee was in uh, 2005. So we're coming up on, you know, 20 years of an entrepreneurial journey, which is, you know, not only kind of you know, created jobs, you know, for myself, but also for dozens of people, um, you know, who have fed their families off of what we're creating and driving and innovating that otherwise didn't exist. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of kind of creation around taking ideas from ether to entity and scaling is really, really hard. <laughs> it's probably one yeah. of the, the, the hardest jobs there is. And people are like, oh, you know, I'd like to start a company. And I'm like, I don't think it's what you think it is. <laughs> it's not a lifestyle <laughs> thing, you know, like, yeah, it's a take over your life. Yeah. There, yeah. Thing. Um, yeah. There's a lot more involved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so you've certainly... Yeah, you've certainly had an impact on Chicago and, you know, even and the economic development and just sort of giving back to the community. Um, you've been very active. But if we look at the, the flip side of that from these companies, these various companies that you've built over time, over this, you know, 20 year entrepreneurial journey, um, what are a couple of the specific learnings that you've applied in building planting hope and that has impacted planting hope? So that's a, that's a phenomenal question. You know, we've touched earlier in this conversation on how um, direct learnings impact what you do next. If you listen to them <laughs> and you apply them. Um, yeah, that's, that's part of it. I, you know, I think um, one of the key things I'd impart is a lot of entrepreneurs have significant passion around the idea and building the product. Um, but the end game is heavily driven by how you finance that entity and that company. Um, and the financing piece is as important as anything else you do. And I've seen um, bad financial partners kill otherwise healthy, fantastic businesses. Um, 
And that so so one of the things we did with the Planning Hope Company is rather than take on venture capital at an early stage, uh, we opted to go public at an early stage. And we went public on the Toronto Venture Exchange um, because there isn't a similar exchange in the U.S., frankly. And for us, this was the first time that I'd taken a company public. But we did it for a number of reasons, and one of them was because it was a great way to kind of uh, get our experience as a public company before moving to a big board, and from here could uplist mm -hmm. to the NASDAQ or NYSE, which is still in the cards. You know, we've had a couple of years mm -hmm. in the capital markets, but that's the right path for us going forward. Now, I've received a lot of challenges on that. Well, you'd be either easier to finance if you were a, a, a private company, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the thing. All of our shareholders have the same common stock. And that, you know, it has a public price on it. Uh, people know what they're investing in and they know what their potential return is. And it's all very transparent. In the food industry in particular, we've seen very disappointed um, employees and entrepreneurs who, by the time they got to, you know, an eight-figure exit, uh, most of that went to their financing partners. And there was little and sometimes nothing mm -hmm. left over for the people who built the company. So I think, you know, paying attention to the financing strategy earlier and what the implications are rather than just the ideas, we'll take this from here to there and then we'll sell it for, you know, X is really, really important. And it's something that a lot of entrepreneurs are naive to because of the culture we've built around this understanding of how companies are funded. And then the other one is that we're going through right now is, you know, how you structure your board of directors. And there's one simple learning I'd put in there. Um, we, in the past, I've had many boards of directors. I've found the directors who are most impactful are those who have the time to invest in the company. Um, and sometimes you bring on folks who are fantastic, great experience, great networks, but they've also got a really big full-time job. And at the end of the day, you know, can they, you know, be really part of driving your company? Should they be a board member? Maybe they should be an advisory board member where, you know, they're less, their involvement is less critical to the company's governance. So really looking mm -hmm. for the people that not only have the chops, but also have the time or the skill sets that you need for the company at that point in time are important too. Yeah, and I think you're spot on because there are, I've sat on a number of boards, public and private, mm -hmm. and when you're in there, I mean, the you, you need to be able to spend the time and understand the company deeply to add value. Um, but there are so many times where uh, there are leaders, there are CEOs that just want to add the credentials, but don't think through it in that way. And what you really need is the engagement of the board more than anything, because that's the reason you're bringing them on, especially in a public company, you're paying them in some way, shape or form, uh, you know, significantly versus in a startup where you can get away with not paying much or, you know, not paying at all. And people will come in as advisors just to be nice. <laughs> that doesn't happen in public companies. So, um, so you are on the Toronto uh, Venture Exchange under symbol M-Y-L-K, milk, I love that. Um, so for U.S. traders or U.S. investors, um, are, are you, you talking about, uh, you know, possibly moving at some point in the cards to a U.S. exchange, but for U.S. investors today, can they invest in milk? in the planting hope company in some way. Yep, absolutely. We're cross-listed on the OTCQB under MYLKF and we have DTC listing which means that you can, you know, access it through a lot of electronic platforms. And so that's also possible. And then, you know, from time to time, you know, we do private placements as well. Um, so anyone who's interested in that can just contact us directly. So Julia, I saw that you've recently added to your board of directors um, and you have a higher than average percentage of women on your board, which is absolutely nice to see. You don't see that very often. Well, we're proud of that percentage. Um, and we have looked specifically to see if we can find women board members to add to our board, because let's face it, 90% of the people that make decisions about what new food products to bring into the home are women. 
Um, and what we've found consistently is that there are hundreds of well-qualified women who are underboarded right now. They've got the capacity and the kudos and the bona fides to be able to perform on boards. And they're interested in joining boards that align with their interests. So not only have we managed to do that on the board of directors level, but also our advisory board is about today about 80% female as well. Yeah, that's impressive. And your executive C-suite, right? Yep. Yeah, you know, we again, we've been able to attract, I think, even better candidates than we could have gotten in just, you know, a general look at the market, because we're fostering an environment that really values the contributions that people bring to the table, you know, and and has nothing to do with, you know, their, their ethnic gender or other orientations. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a simple statement to make in today's world, but I will tell you, you know, over the course of the last 20 years, I have seen a lot of misogyny and other discrimination creep into, you know, emerging companies coming from all sorts of different places. So with this one, we founded it, frankly, with a very firm no asshole rule. <laughs> and that is a founding um, you know, principle of the company because life's too short. And so we really look for people that fit culturally, but who also bring the value of the diversity that they represent to the table. And I could not agree more on that rule. I totally agree with that from top to bottom. Okay, I am going to jump over to strategy um, because over this course of eight years, you've uh, you you have your your uh, number of years that you've done research, the commercialization. And now it appears you're certainly focused on growth and acquisitions as part of your strategy. Um, so with our goatee being fairly recent, um, walk us through the strategy in acquiring our goatee or our goatee's assets. So Argo Tea is a phenomenal tea cafe that, you know, came to be into being about 20 years ago. And frankly, maybe it was a little early for its time in terms of what was developing specifically in the U.S. market. You know, Argo focused around high quality hot and iced tea beverages and also had coffee on the menu, but also very high quality food products with clean natural ingredients and things. It was often referred to as the Starbucks of tea. And frankly, in the U.S., there hasn't really been an equivalent to Argo that's grown and scaled. Um, Argo has a very dedicated fan base, we found as well, since we, you know, acquired the assets. And Argo grew to... Julia, three... I'm one of those fans. Ah, I'm awesome. one of those fans. Excellent. <laughs> well, you'll be pleased to hear we're bringing it back. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> because Argo, you know, during, you know, its growth period, I mean, look, you know, it's hard to make money with cafes. And, you know, Argo, you know, was in that camp. Um, they had three different business units. One of them was their company-owned cafes, which is principally what you know. They owned most of the cafes. But then they found that there was a great opportunity to license those cafes to other operators. And, and here's how the licensing works. Let's say that a college or university wants an Argo T on campus. Well, the college or university will pay for the uh, capital expenditures to build it out. And then typically they've got a managed food service organization like a Sodexo or Aramark, which are names you may know just because they are the big behemoths globally that run a lot of the food service operations everywhere from public schools through to corporate campuses. And that's what they're really good at. It's buying, you know, the inventory and running the cafes and staffing them day to day. Well, where Argo comes into the equation is with the Argo Tea concept and the menu and the products and the design and the look and feel. And the Argo operating license piece of the business is what really attracted to us. Unfortunately, with COVID, they had to shut down most of the corporate owned cafes, but there were still quite a few of the operating licenses running. Um, and that's a business which is much easier to scale. You know, you can't create that overnight and grow it and grow that loyalty. But once you have that brand, there's real opportunities to grow. So that's why we bought Argo Tea. Um, and currently today, we have eight operating licenses licenses at major colleges and universities that are run by the Sodexos and Aramarks of the world. Um, and so what we're looking to do is to continue to scale that model 
So, you know, bring more Argos and scale those, but we're also doing those with some high quality partners. You know, we're looking for partners that really bring the same quality standards to the table. So for instance, Farmer's Fridge, we're partnering with them to bring their salads into the cafes. Um, we have a partnership with Ely on the coffee side um, that we're bringing to the equation. You know, there are a lot of different things that we're doing to bring world-class partners around, but there's a key element that unites all of those. And that is a focus on sustainability because we really think that the opportunity for, you know, for brands within the if quick service restaurant space or cafe space going forward is to be able to bring sustainability front and center. Um, and that's through everything from the ingredients to the packaging to the operations. So as we adapt Argo 2.0, as we call it, for the next you know, generation of expansion, sustainability is a key focus for us. And it's why we chose the partners that we have so far. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think customer is um, customers are focused on that as well. So I think, you know, timing and uh, your focus uh, for the company is is really important. Right. When you look at global warming and everything else happening um, on this earth today, uh, really, really great that that you have brought together all the right partners. So one of the things um you, I, I read is that 90 some percent, over 90 percent of Argo's revenue was from packaged goods. Mm -hmm. um, so is that something, because uh, I also read that like the ready to drink products were going to be potentially phased out. So can, can mm -hmm. you sort of talk to both of those, um, both of those things and how that uh, fits into your longer term plan? Yeah, that's a fantastic question because that was the third piece of Argo and it was a significant um, piece of Argo's revenue. Unfortunately, it was also not profitable. Um, the concept was, and this is a great concept, and this is how the other two businesses of Argo were developed, is take the core of what's successful at the cafe and either put it in an operating license or put it in a ready-to-drink beverage. So they took their top ready-to-drink beverages and put them in beautiful glass bottles and sold those at stores you know, nationwide, as well as in their own cafes. Um, unfortunately, those glass bottles are really expensive and the, they're really expensive to make and they're really expensive to ship. And the business model at the time didn't allow for that. Um, while Argo was going through a reorganization, they also changed the formulas. And rather than using cane sugar, which is what's used in the stores, um, there was a thought that there was an opportunity to target a slightly different consumer with a low calorie beverage that included a combination of allulose and stevia. Unfortunately, allulose is not allowed in the natural products industry. Um, so folks like Whole Foods won't carry it. And they also, due to both supply chain issues and cost issues, switched to a plastic bottle, um, which didn't fit with also, you know, their customer gestalt. So there were some core changes made to the product that was successful that rather than driving profitability, changed what it was. Um, the ready to drink category is hyper competitive. If you do it in the grocery stores, that's one thing. If you do it at things like convenience stores, you're faced with direct um, distribution folks, DSD folks like Pepsi and Coke, who come in and reface those shelves and frankly can take you right out <laughs> of your spots. <laughs> so every day you're fighting not only to you know get the shelf space, but to maintain it and to stay on the shelves. So it's, it's a highly competitive, highly expensive business to get in and be successful. Is there an opportunity for it? Oh, absolutely, there's an opportunity for it, but it needs to be with the right strategy and with the right products. For instance, mm -hmm. we see a future where maybe, you know, sesame milk teas, right? Milk teas like the Asian milk teas, but with sesame milk, but with canisters, maybe with boba in them. You know, a product mm -hmm. like that, which is truly differentiated in the right packaging and in the right channels could be a huge opportunity. And we know that consumers love the old Argo tea in bottles, but we're not in a position. Our goal right now for the Planning Hope Company across the board is to turn the corner on profitability in 2024. And that's why we're focused so heavily on food service. 
we had a lot of distribution earlier on in grocery stores. And frankly, we eliminated quite a bit of it. Grocery store distribution requires investment not only in slotting, but also promotion and a thousand other expenses that get drawn out of your check. Food service doesn't operate that way. So with grocery retail, you know, we could invest for several years and then start to make money, or we could immediately focus on transactionally profitable revenue, which would help get the company into a better footing. Um, and also is what the capital markets are asking for today. The days of just top line revenue growth without profitability are done. So long story short, ready to drink beverages. Yes, there's an opportunity. But the business model needs to go back to square one and be reinvented around the right time, right product, right place, right packaging, right distribution for that to be successful. Mm -hmm. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. And, you know, you're doing this all while the car is moving and you are on a public company stage um, mm -hmm. while you shift. But you know what? M&A is part of my favorite part of, you know, building a company, growing a company. Um, uh, looking at that strategy. So quick question on M&A and the M&A process. What do you label as the most important part of the M&A process? So it's identifying a unique asset that really fits into our portfolio. Something that's so good that it's as good or better as something we could have invented ourselves in-house. Um, mm -hmm. And those opportunities are few and far between. Um, over the last couple of years, many of the things that have been funded in the food categories are me too. Um, and there's not a lot of original IP or brand behind those that we can build on. So what we look on is a core that has the opportunity to properly developed and scaled be a multi-billion dollar business, not a, not a hundred million dollar business, things that really could be scaled globally to multi-billion dollar businesses. And the two brands that we've acquired are Goatee and Right Rice. Right Rice is a grain of rice that's 10% rice flour, 90% peas, beans, and lentils, and has four times the protein in white rice. Um, you can get it on the menu of Kava restaurants nationwide. That is a multi-billion dollar global opportunity. Um, our goatees are the same. You know, right now, one of the markets that has the most cafes in the in, in entire world. If, if I had to ask you, uh, Christy, you know the coffee industry, you know the tea industry. What city do you think right now in the world has the most cafes? Isn't it in China somewhere? <laughs> it's Shanghai. And it, it, it has more coffee cafes as well. Coffee didn't exist, you know, as a market in China 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Concepts right, like right. Argo tea are right in the sweet spot of what's happening, you know, in China right now. Uh, right. Sesame milk is right in the sweet spot of what's happening. Oat milk grew, you know, um, from 45 million to 6 billion in seven years. You know, we're talking about products and industries that have multi-billion dollar opportunities. And a lot of what we see are nice products that could grow at grocery, but they don't have that kind of legs. So for us is, does it fit with the core of what we're doing? Does it have that kind of, you know, food tech or other, you know, un incomparable innovation? And is this mm -hmm. something that we is worth the time and focus for us to take to the next level? Or does it otherwise fit in strategically? Because frankly, one of the biggest reasons we bought our goatee is to be able to immediately jump into existing um, uh, relationships with major food service operators that control billions of dollars of food spend and get our products front and center in front of them. So that added strategically as well. You've accomplished so much over the course of your career and you've learned so much. I, I'm i curious, how many different mentors have you had or do you just have any that you absolutely positively are like, you know that their contribution to what um, you've learned and applied uh, is there like one person specifically that you can point to? So I will say that there are a lot of people who've contributed pieces over time, um, you know, in, in many, many different aspects and areas and times and places that that was important. 
a couple of years ago, I was invited to join an organization uh, called Exceptional Women Alliance. That's about lifelong mentoring. And there I found a group of like 150 additional women who are all part of that process. And that's what we do. Uh, the woman who founded it, Lorraine Siegel, um, you know, has had an immense impact through founding that organization and asked me to be a part of it. Um, and, you know, beyond that, I'd say that it's a lot of individuals that have played that part over time, yeah. um, which is why, you know, from my perspective, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> but when I can, you know, support an up and coming entrepreneur with some introductions or some advice or impart some of the things that uh, have been hard lessons learned that maybe somebody else, you know, if they listen, doesn't need to reinvent that, um, that particular piece of learning and can save some time, I'm happy to share. What's, what's the most valuable thing you've learned from one of your mentors? You know, many years ago, um, as I was coming out of Kellogg and it's terrible market, once again, 2002, um, you know, no jobs, you know, market was in the crunch, et cetera. I was given the opportunity to go into United Airlines and help with the turnaround. And I'm like, eh, is this what I should do? I don't know. Is this what I should do next? And I sat down um with a you know a serial entrepreneur a friend of mine and i said what do you think and he's like just start and i'm like what do you mean he's like just start somewhere he's like go take that job it'll lead somewhere it'll lead to the next step and the next step and the next step what you got to do is just start just start moving and take those opportunities who knew that that would lead me to food right which is where i you know not only have built businesses for the last 20 years but that's where i met my husband you know, there's so many pieces that came off of that one decision that you could have never, you know, mm -hmm. traced back. So I think right. one of the pivotal pieces is just start, just do it and something mm -hmm. else will come and come and come. It's stasis yep. that kills you. Yeah, totally agree. Forward movement so important and opportunities do present itself for sure. So do you have a life motto or words you simply live by? <laughs> Well, we have several things that we teach our kids early on. Um, yeah, we've been developing these. The first one is never give the drummer the keys to the van. It will okay. inevitably lead, lead to heartbreak. Don't trust the drummer. Um, I apologize to any drummers who are listening, but this this is my, my husband was also a sound engineer before he went into food. So um, the other one is, you know, customer retention is always less expensive than customer acquisition. So true. That's worth highlighting for sure. And did you have a third one that you were going to share? No, we're working on the third. Um, I, I <laughs> but those two were sticking by. <laughs> yes, those are great. Those are great. Is there one piece of advice you'd give to someone who wants to start a food tech company, acquire another company, or just start their own company? Uh, so in terms of starting a food tech company specific, if you're talking about the products um, side of things, I would say that there is an immense amount of innovation out there that's not being captured right now and that you can take to the next level. But I think the important thing in evaluating it is going throughout the whole supply chain. You know, what is the product? The ingredients that we use are all really easy ones to come by. And if you're really looking to scale, for instance, if you're looking to go into something like a Starbucks someday, the most important piece of your product is going to be the supply chain. Can you supply it consistently to everywhere at all times without that issue? So if you apply innovation to something like quinoa, um, which is not a scalable crop, it only grows in the Andes, you know, it doesn't go very far. Um, and so, but there's so many ways to apply these innovations that have not been cracked. And there are a lot of people spending time on coming up with those ingredients, but don't know how to take them to the next level and commercialize them. So if you can provide that bridge, um, that's, that's a clear opportunity. Um, yeah, I'd also say fun. that in the food industry, one of the most important pieces to understand about intellectual property is the most valuable intellectual property or trade secrets and formulas and processes. Coca-Cola is a trade secret. It's not a patented product. And people will ask you about your patents. You'll be like, oh, do I get a patent? Well, corn the other day, um, two years ago, they lost their patents on their mushroom product because patents only work for 20 years. You know, they're, they're, and then all of a sudden it was public domain. And when you publish that information, it's all there and can just be easily tweaked. And then it's how much you want to spend on lawyers to defend it. 
Exactly, exactly. Okay, so piece of advice, um, acquiring another company. So there will inevitably be stuff that you don't know, and there's only so much you can find out in due diligence. Uh, so be prepared for a lot of surprises. And it doesn't matter, you know, how much diligence you do ahead of time. So you'll get better at asking the questions as you do more. But there will always be surprises. And some of them will be good surprises, uh, but most of them will be bad surprises. And uh, just be prepared for that. I, I laugh only because I've been there and done that far too many times. And it is. That is so true. There are always bad surprises. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, and then uh, quickly, just a piece of advice on just starting a company in general, because you've started so many along the way. I think mm -hmm. you probably have an incredible, you know, a uh, piece of advice you can share with our viewers. Yeah, there, there's a very simple but critically, critically important one, um, which is protect your sleep. You know, however much sleep you need as a person, and that can vary, you know, for me, seven, eight hours is good. Make sure that you have a strategy for getting that consistently every single day. And that will do more to fuel you than even, you know, working out exercise or anything else, which often are things that you get so busy, you can't fit into your day. Yeah. Wow. I actually love that piece of advice because I don't think anybody has said that along the way. And yet that is such a critical aspect that most people don't pay attention to. And it's, you know, it, historically, it's sort of been a badge of honor to say that you're running on two hours of sleep. Well, it's really not. It makes you want to just shake that person and go, oh, you could be so much better if you had a reasonable amount of sleep. Building and running a company, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint where you're going to get through this next month and then things are going to be different. No, you're going to be doing this for years. There are going to be other things that get thrown at you. It could get harder. So you've got to have the stamina to get through it. And you can't do that by stringing yourself along on two hours of sleep and a lot of caffeine. I mean, caffeine is important, but <laughs> so is the sleep. Yes. So true. So true. Okay. So I am going to jump in to our, what I'll call a lightning round of just rapid fire questions with just very brief answers, um, mm -hmm. all coffee related in some way, shape or form. Uh, so can you share a general coffee industry stat, coffee or tea industry stat, stat that you find interesting or fascinating? At, at this point, um, major coffee shops like Starbucks in the U.S., more than 75% of their beverages are served iced. Huh. Along those same lines, share a random fascinating fact that most coffee or tea consumers probably don't know. Mm. Um, the, um, a lot of the branded beans that you buy from, again, folks like Starbucks and Dunkin' in supermarkets are actually not produced and roasted by Starbucks and Dunkin'. Those are done under license by other large CPG brands. And now I'm going to shift to the U3 top three. Uh, your favorite brewing method? I uh, only brew espresso <laughs> myself. Um, through good quality machines and uh, the, 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 as convenient as I'll get uh, will be uh, the Ely Eper espresso cups. That's, that's as fast as I can go. Perfect. And I saw you sipping your espresso earlier. So for consumption, I think I know this answer, but coffee um, or drink of choice. It's, a, it's, it's an espresso all day long. However, <laughs> I will say... <laughs> that um, sesame milk and espresso makes an unbelievably fantastic beverage. And so if I'm not drinking this, what I will drink is a new one we came up with that has sesame milk, espresso, a Tirani um, a toasted sesame syrup. And this is really important. Argo had a very innovative bubble tea product. And effectively it's fermented coconut water cut into squares and a caramel syrup. You add a scoop of that over ice and it is delicious. I am trying that for sure. That sounds amazing. And the, I have to say too, and I know these are our rapid fire, but the sesame milk has this amazing nutty flavor that is, I, I just haven't tasted in a number of the other, um, the other, uh, you know, nut milks. So I, worth sharing, worth sharing. Okay. So how many cups of coffee do you drink per day? 
So again, back to the espresso, I'll have about four of these a day and that's the right, um, that's the right level for me. Now, people who are drinking coffees this big, I can't do that. There's more caffeine in a drip coffee like this than there is in the, uh, in the espresso. <laughs> Number three. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to share where someone can learn more about you, Julia, and the Planting Hope Company. Well, if you want to know anything about me, um, I think I'm the only Julia Stamberger on the planet, uniquely. Uh, so Google that. <laughs> but uh, the Planning Hope Company, more importantly, uh, we have a lot of information at planninghopecompany.com. As a publicly traded company, you can uh, see an investor overview. We have a lot of press releases, news releases, webinars and things. So there's a lot of content there. And then it will also link you to planninghopebrands.com where we have our products available for sale as well. Wonderful. Well, what an inspiring story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. And thanks for being here. No, really. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been great. Absolutely. And of course, thanks for helping us unite the world through coffee. And thank you to you, our followers, for joining us at U3 Coffee. We'll see you next time.